Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. We're continuing our reading and discussion of the book, the most powerful and educational book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. Yesterday, we concluded with a discussion about a series of tracts that were put out by the Roman Catholic Church through a Roman Catholic publication house, one of which outlined the temporal power of the Pope. The tract made the Pope the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that the Pope is sovereign of the sovereign, the highest ecclesiastical and temporal court in the world, that no power on earth had the authority to question his acts or his teachings. And another track we began to talk about at the end of the broadcast was track number 43 in a series, and it dealt with specifically the duty of every Roman Catholic to obey the Pope. Now, what we're establishing here, for those who haven't already figured it out, is the establishment of the papacy as the divine right ruler of the world and also the establishment in this country, known as a Protestant nation, a fifth column, uh, a domestic fifth column living right here in the United States that R.W. Thompson perceived as the greatest threat to our Protestant constitutional republic and our freedom of conscience freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, our right to worship God according to the written word of God, the true faith of Jesus Christ, the gravest threat to Protestantism ever in this country. A fifth column of Roman Catholics whose first allegiance is not to the Constitution, nor to our nation, but to the Pope, and a very insidious encroachment into the liberties of the people of the United States, raising up an army of Roman Catholics within our nation that, it, that when given the command to overthrow the Constitution and to take over this free republic, this Protestant republic, and turn it into a papal dictatorship, was a very real possibility, and that possibility exists even today. People don't recognize it, but we do here at Inquisition Update, and so did R.W. Thompson. Now, he says, dealing with this Tract 43, it dealt with, this, with specifically the duty of every Roman Catholic to obey the Pope. And if you're following along, we're on page 89 of the book, uh, the first couple uh, sentences of uh, the first paragraph on the page omitted. It will begin with the word here. The duty, speaking of this, uh, this tract, he says here the duty of all Catholics to obey the Pope is laid down as the starting point. All his quote-unquote laws are represented as quote, confirmed by a divine sanction and are obligatory upon the conscience in the same manner as the laws of Moses were binding upon the Jews, unquote. So he's simply saying, I take the place of Moses among Catholics. When I speak, you must listen and obey, because I am, as Moses was, the representative of God to the Jews. I am the representative of God to the world. Quite arrogant, isn't it? And blasphemous, too. And he says, he is called the sovereign, speaking of the Pope, he is called the, quote, sovereign judge and lawgiver from whose decisions and judgments there is no appeal. In other words, he is the highest authority in the world. And it says, being, quote, the head of the whole church and the father and teacher of all Christians, unquote, he requires, therefore, obedience to his doctrinal decisions and to his laws. In certain cases, under the penalty of excommunication, 
All this having been announced, this little tract proceeds to define this extraordinary authority. Uh, authority. Here's what it says. Quote, The authority of the Pope to teach and command the faithful in regard to all things relating to the doctrines which they are to hold or to reject, and in regard to all things relating to religious and moral acts which they are to do or to avoid, has been given to him, the Pope, by Jesus Christ, unquote. Thereupon the faithful are instructed that the popes exercising the divine power of the keys have forbidden certain opinions to be maintained and certain acts to be done, and that these commands are ratified in heaven and are therefore to be respected and obeyed as really emanating from Jesus Christ himself. Unquote. Then passing from this blasphemous comparison of the Pope with Christ, it condemns Freemasonry as already under the curse of several popes before the present one, denies the right of a, quote, private person to judge the rulers of the church, unquote, thus asserting full official impunity for every member of the hierarchy, endeavors with an exceedingly thin veil of sophistry to evade the charge of ecclesiastical interference with political opinions, and defines with the utmost precision the comprehensiveness of papal authority. It would be hard to find more explicit language. And before we get into the language of this tract, of this teaching from the Pope, I want to just briefly touch on the author's reference to Freemasonry. Obviously, R.W. Thompson and I have a differing opinion about Freemasonry, and I suspect, as is commonly the case, R.W. Thompson perceived Freemasonry as a generally Protestant institution, a Protestant charitable institution, when in fact the Jesuits had been in control of Freemasonry during the founding of this country, and while attracting many nominal Protestants into the organization, secretly at the top of Freemasonry, it is controlled by the Jesuit general. And I suspect that R.W. Thompson, like many, failed in discovering the Jesuit connection in the Freemasonic order, and that it is nothing but another secret society over which the Jesuits control and simply use Protestantism, or Protestants rather, to achieve papal goals. And one of the goals of Freemasonry is a global religion wherein you can worship any god. So long as you believe in a supreme being, you are qualified to become a Freemason. It's not a Christian religion, but it is a religion. And secretly at the top, the Jesuits control it, and they simply use Protestants to achieve Vatican goals, unbeknownst to them, of course. And they achieve that through the uh, compartmentalization within the organization that is evidenced by its degrees of advancement. And the higher you go into Freemasonry, the more and more obvious it becomes that it is not a Christian religion, that it is an ecumenical religion, and ultimately, the grand master, the grand worshipful master of Freemasonry is the papacy. And the Jesuit order got control of, the, of, of Freemasonry early on to cover its acts through Freemasonry. It's just a, a, a cooperative third party in the Jesuit intention of making one man the ruler of the world. Now, I know that wasn't as brief as I intended it to be, but nonetheless, he seems a bit complimentary of Freemasonry, saying that the papacy denounced Freemasonry. My suggestion is the papacy denounced Freemasonry so that Catholics couldn't join it to discover Jesuit priests actually controlling the organization. But anyway... Now, getting back to the language of this tract, it says, 
the authority of the church, and we're talking about the Roman Catholic Church, which claims to be the only church of Jesus Christ, when in fact it is the synagogue of Satan himself, it says the authority of the church exerts over all things relating to morality, over all questions of right and wrong, duty and transgression of duty, justice and injustice, lawfulness and unlawfulness. As well might one talk of our Lord Jesus Christ interfering with human rights as his vicar and his church. Man is responsible to God in all his relations, as a child or a parent, a subject, citizen, artisan, merchant, lawyer, legislator, or governor. The moral law, the rule of right and wrong, runs through the state, society, the family, and every uh, relation or institution in which man is a free agent, having rights and duties. The church is supreme that is, the Roman Catholic Church is supreme in deciding all moral questions, and the Pope is the sovereign minister of God with power to punish by his spiritual censures, censures all infractions of the divine law, unquote. Real heady stuff, isn't it? And, of course, they don't wear all this on their sleeves. You have to dig to find it. And R.W. Thompson discloses the real sentiments of the Vatican and its intention in the world and what might be the end of all that. I'll just briefly call it the New World Order. That's what it's all about. George H.W. Bush spoke about it in a, in a State of the Union address, and it's the real deal. R.W. Thompson foresaw this new world order, and it says, When it shall become necessary further along to examine the doctrines of the encyclical and syllabus of error of Pope Pius IX and other instructions to his subjects, this extract will furnish a key to his meaning. In the meantime, it should be observed how distinctly and emphatically it is announced in his American tract that the authority and jurisdiction of the Roman Catholic Church and that of the Pope as its supreme head and of the clergy as the instruments he employs in the exaction of his power is so full, comprehensive, and all-absorbing as to embrace the entire man in all his relations of life, in all the duties he owes to himself, to his family, to society, and to the state of which he is a citizen, and to be the government to which he owes allegiance. Every thought, word, and act, every impulse and passion of the mind, all the affections and hatreds of the heart, must be subordinated to the will of the Pope, who as sovereign Lord of the universe, as God on earth, must acquire a dominion so complete that every society, community, and government in the world shall be constructed, regulated, and managed according to the law of God as the Pope shall declare and announce it. If Protestantism is infidelity and heresy, it must be exterminated. If free thought is quote-unquote sinful, it must be suppressed. If a free press opens the door to revolution or licentiousness, it must be destroyed. If free speech is offensive to pontifical or hierarchical ears, there must be no more of it. If a republican or popular government secures all these privileges and provides for their continuance, it must be overthrown. If the Constitution of the United States prohibits, quote-unquote, an establishment of religion or any impairment to the right of its free exercise, it must be put out of the way and papal imperialism take the place of the will of the people which it expresses. If any man, supposing himself to be free, shall dare to consult his own conscience in matters of religious belief or moral duty, or to interpret the Bible for himself, he must be stricken down by the sword of pontifical wrath, 
and the papal anathema rest upon his name forever. And then, with all this is accomplished, when all of this is accomplished, when mankind shall be compelled to recognize true religion as consisting only in passive obedience to the quote-unquote laws of the quote-unquote king of Rome, the pope, and his bishops, and his, priests shall all st- and his priests shall all stand ready to plunge the world once more into medieval bondage. How do you like the new world order so far? We already know what the old world order was like, don't we? This is exactly what, why I say R.W. Thompson is prophetic. He is simply telling us that if the Pope ever gains the authority in this country that he had in medieval Europe, we will suffer the same condition as medieval Europe. And that is precisely what he is warning against. He says, when Rome was mistress of the world, that is, during the old world order, when the popes were at the height of their power, during the dark and medieval ages, None of her despots wore a diadem so imperial as this. Now, he says, this is not the place for a philosophical disquisition upon the varied qualities of the mind or its tendency to be impressed by surrounding circumstances. We all know that it may be educated to adopt almost any class of opinions, especially when its higher capacities are left unimproved. The papacy, well understanding this, has been always accustomed to determine and regulate the kind of instruction to be given to the members of the Roman Catholic Church, prescribing the particular books they shall read, and prohibiting the reading of others under penalty of the pontifical curse. There is at Rome as an essential department of the papal court, what is called the Congregation of the Index. To this tribunal are submitted all publications that are in any degree under the suspicion of heresy. And if upon examination they are found to teach what the Pope does not desire to be taught, they are condemned and placed upon the Index Expurgatorius, so that Thereafter, it shall be regarded as an offense against the Roman Catholic Church and against God for any person to read them. Examples of this are abundant. That in reference to the books of Galileo being a prominent one, Galileo taught the Copernican theory of the revolution of the earth upon its axis. And as the Roman Catholic Church taught the contrary, that is, that the earth was stationary and the sun revolved around it. Pope Paul uh, V caused uh, Galileo's writings to be condemned and prohibited the reading of them. And Pope Urban VIII not only repeated this prohibition, but caused the great astronomer to be tried, convicted, and imprisoned during life for having dared to teach such quote-unquote heresy. It says there are very few popes in history who have not added to the number of the books listed on the index of forbidden books. The present pope has adopted a more comprehensive method, while still adhering to that of his predecessors, by frequent and general denunciation of all that class of books which advocate liberalism, Protestantism, republicanism, free thought, free speech, and a free press. Therefore, while such works as are called forth by the progressive and advanced spirit of the present age are condemned as impious and heretical because their tendency is to weaken and destroy the divine right of kings to govern mankind and are kept out of the hands of the faithful Roman Catholics wherever it can by possibility be done, the hierarchy actively employ their learning and ingenuity in preparing and circulating such books, magazines, newspapers, pamphlets, and tracts as those from which the foregoing extracts are taken and in inculcating and the inculcation of sentiments they contain. 
They calculated largely upon the indifference of the great body of the people of the United States to such subjects, well understanding at the same time that whatever they shall thus circulate in support of papal omnipotence will be impressed upon the minds of their, stu of their superstitious followers, Roman Catholics, especially the ignorant portion of them, by the numerous foreign and Jesuit priests who are scattered over the country. And now we're getting to the main thrust of this. It was the foreign priests, the foreign educated priests, they were not born and raised in this country. They did not have any allegiance to this nation. They had allegiance only to the Pope. And no one else in the world fits that description more than the Jesuit priests of Rome who were scattered all over this country, proffering these tracts, condemning our Constitution, condemning our Protestant liberties, and suggesting in the hearts of all the Roman Catholics that this nation was heretical and that it was their spiritual and temporal obligation to the Pope to uphold his scepter and to overthrow this Protestant nation and all of its Protestant tenets and to return this land to the strict control of the papacy. Now it says these priests are especially prepared for this purpose by previous training at Rome and elsewhere, and are quite ready at all times to lay these doctrines before their congregations and to instruct them that unless they believe and practice them, they will assuredly fall under the anathemas of the Roman Catholic Church. As between, the institu as between the institutions of the United States and the papal institutions that existed at Rome before the temporal power of the Pope was taken away by the Italian people, remember, the Italian people rebelled against the papacy, threw off his temporal th authority, and established their own republic, quite contrary to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. Yes, the Italians set the example for the rest of the world they followed the Protestant lead, and they kicked the Antichrist out of their business and established their own constitution. And it says, these priests prefer the latter, insisting that they are founded upon the law of God, while the former are heretical. Therefore, they work hard to bring about the time when the Pope shall command the people of the United States. They acting as his captains and lieutenants. That is their intention. The Jesuit intention in this country is to roam this world, unite the Roman Catholic people against the government to take it little by little, and turn this country over to the strict authority of the papacy, whereby the Jesuits would become his captains and lieutenants. And I assert that that day is today. R. W. Thompson seeing this back in 1876, I declare that that day has arrived. The Jesuits, having been rejected in every nation in Europe, fled to this country, found refuge, found freedom of religion, and they have operated unhindered in this country, and their object has been won. The Constitution has been overthrown. The government now serves the papacy, and now open religious persecution against Protestantism will begin. And the best example of that is Vatican Council II, the Ecumenical Council, Peace and Unity with the Pope of Rome. The author, R. W. Thompson, having only briefly dealt with the Jesuit order, trust me, he'll return to the Jesuits later in the book, he returns now to the subject of Dr. Brownson. Remember, Dr. Brownson was the so-called Protestant who converted to Roman Catholicism, who was elicited, most likely by the Jesuits, to use his reformed, <laughs> reformed, or rather deformed, Catholic mind and his pen to write a series of eloquent articles that were widely published that said the obvious, that any good government is fashioned under God's law. And then he turned around and said that the Pope is God's vicar. 
and the lawgiver of the world. And he returns to the subject of Dr. Brownson. It says, It has already been shown how readily Dr. Brownson entered into this scheme to enslave his native American country by devoting his talents to the service of his foreign, of this foreign priesthood. Previously, we spoke about the foreign priests in this country, and the, particularly the Jesuit order. He was in service to these foreign priests. And it says, ever on the alert to employ his fertile brain to this inglorious work, he has lately published another book, which was considered of so much importance by the Roman Catholic hierarchy that it appeared simultaneously in New York, Boston, and Montreal. In this book, entitled Conversations on Liberalism and the Church, he falsely represents himself as an American Protestant who carries on a conversation with a Roman Catholic priest and allows himself to be converted by him to Romanism. He calls it purely imaginary, but this scarcely relieves him from the charge of disingenuously impersonating a Protestant and putting only such arguments into his mouth as he supposes necessary to secure an unfair advantage to his own church, that is, the Roman Catholic Church, and to the papacy. He defends and justifies the Spanish Inquisition, as an institution necessary, quote, to ferret out and bring to trial, unquote, those who engaged in, quote, secret conspiracies, unquote, against the church and the state. He advocates a union between church and state. That is a violation of our Constitution. Congress shall make no law establishing religion or interfering with the free exercise thereof. But that doesn't work for the Pope. The only time in the world that the Pope is really powerful and successful is when he is in control of the state, when he becomes the state. That's a hermetic union of church and state. And he calls liberty a spiritual right, not a natural right or a civil grant, and insist, therefore, that it can have no power, uh, no proper foundation except on the supremacy of the spiritual order, which the Church, that is, the Roman Catholic Church, has always asserted and defended. Okay, that establishes the Pope's authority over the state, and that he becomes the state, or the state rules at his behest. One power in Rome, it carries two keys, the temporal key, which is his kingly key, his political key, and then the, the spiritual key, right? He's the teacher of all doctrine and morals and faith, okay? He's the end-all and be-all. He is the supreme being on the earth, the representative of God Almighty. That is the teaching of the church. Now, he, said, he continues, he said, Then after expressing his regret, speaking of this Dr. Brownson, that in this country the sovereignty of the people has been resolved into the sovereignty of popular opinion, he makes his priest address the American Protestant this way. Here's what they say to the, Amer to the American Protestant. Quote, you are losing the sense of the great principles on which your fathers built and no longer see or understand the deep significance of the providential constitution of your republic. You are perverting the Christian to the pagan republic. Now, he's speaking of... Uh, it, this is a veiled reference to the Holy Roman Empire as governed by the Pope, as opposed to the pagan Roman Empire governed by the Caesars, which they say was the pagan Rome, and the current Rome under the Pope is the holy Roman Empire, having adopted Christianity as its main religion. It says you are perverting the Christian to the pagan republic. 
and hence your great need of the church to recall, that is, you, your great need of the Roman Catholic Church, to recall your minds to the first principles of your institutions and to enable you to inherit the glory of being the first nation that ever fully asserted spiritual freedom, unquote. Sounds pretty good, right? Well, it gets, it gets better here. It says, this sounds well enough insofar as it pretends to speak favorably of our institutions. But the language of, compl of compliment is employed merely to disguise the real object. The whole context of this book shows that it was written under the influence of a single controlling idea. That is, that the Roman Catholic Church, as represented by the papacy, should obtain supremacy over the people of the United States in order that they may be held to the line of duty to God and to the world as the Pope shall understand and declare it. This idea is not altogether concealed in the above extract, but it is more distinctly expressed elsewhere in the book. It is not a little surprising that with his mind thus impressed, it did not occur to him to inquire how it has happened that the papacy did not establish the freedom of which he writes when it had the world at its feet, and why civil freedom was not fully established until it grew up without the aid and against the protestations of the papacy as one of the legitimate and necessary fruits of the Protestant Reformation. But it must be conceded to him that his idea of spiritual freedom are very different from those which prevail among the Protestants of the United States. What he means by the term <clears throat> spiritual freedom, as, uh, as we shall presently see, is the freedom of the Roman Catholic Church, that is, the freedom of the Pope to govern the world to dictate the law of God to all nations and peoples and to punish disobedience to her edicts. In other words, a return to the old world order. The new world order, as discussed by President George H.W. Bush, is simply a return to the old world order. Now, for example, he says that the dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church are, if anything, above reason. That's right. You don't have to understand it. You just have to obey. And further, he says, being matters within the spiritual order, individuals have nothing to do with them. That's because the Pope is the only one whose purview includes the spiritual order. Man is not to understand the spiritual that's the Pope's job. The Pope's job is to instruct the people and to enforce his laws. And it says he gives the reason elsewhere by insisting that the word of the Roman Catholic Church is as high authority for what God has revealed as is the Bible itself. There you have it. He's equating the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church with the same authority as God's holy word. And therefore, that human laws derive all their vigor as laws from the law of God as proclaimed by the Roman Catholic Church or by the Pope as its lawful and divine head. Now, if this isn't the definition of Antichrist, I don't know how you could create a better one. The Pope is simply replacing Christ, and that's what Antichrist means. The Pope is the replacement of Christ on earth, and that's what this Dr. Brownson is teaching. That's what the Jesuits teach. That's what the, every Roman Catholic in American government today and yesterday and tomorrow will, do, will enforce upon this country, one way or another, by hook or by crook, that the Pope is the only legitimate legal and religious authority in the world. Now, it says, under the dominion of such sentiments as these, he undertakes to show wherein consists the necessity 
of subverting our Protestant institutions and, and substituting for them such as the Church, the Roman Catholic Church or the Pope, shall consider consistent with the law of God. As they do not tend to elevate and advance mankind and are in these respects greatly behind the Roman Catholic nations, the latter are, in his opinion, entitled to a decided preference. He says this, quote, Christian nations alone are living and progressive nations, and never have Christian nations adhere, uh, excuse me, and never have Christian nations advanced in all that makes the true glory of civilization so rapidly as they did from the downfall of Rome to the rise of what you call the Protestant Reformation, unquote. In other words, the Protestant Reformation saw no advancement of mankind. The Protestant Reformation was an error. And pr mankind's progress ended with the Protestant Reformation. That progress is only seen during the reign of the popes. And he says, and, and, and R.W. Thompson says, pursuing this train of thought, he insists that with the exception of the discovery by Catholics of this Western Hemisphere, and remember it was Christopher Columbus, a Roman Catholic, sent here, uh, by authority of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain to conquer the New World for the Pope, the Pope lays, lays claim to the Western Hemisphere because it was his project to explore new lands and conquer new lands for Christ, which means for the Pope. It says... Pursuing this train of thought, he insists that with the exception of the discovery by Catholics of this Western Hemisphere and the practical adoption of some papal principles, there has been, quote, no real progress of civilization since the epoch, the epoch of the Protestant Reformation, unquote. Such sentiments would, of course, lead him to give the preference to Roman Catholic governments over those arising out of the Protestant liberty and toleration, and to see in the Roman Catholic populations a higher degree of elevation and advancement than is to be found among those Protestant nations. I have a question to ask. Since the Pope's encyclical, Caritas in Veritate, which seeks to redistribute the world's wealth. Where is that wealth that he redistributes coming from? It's coming from Protestant nations. Uniquely Protestant nations. The United States, Britain, and Australia. And now, if, if America, Britain, and Australia are so advanced, how can they turn around and claim that no advancement had taken place since the Protestant Reformation? Why is it that the Pope has to take from the rich Protestant nations and give to the poor Catholic nations? It pays to think a little, doesn't it? It says, and to indicate this preference, he applauds the, quote, moral elevation and personal dignity of the Catholic peasantry, which he considers due to the fact that their religion attaches, quote, attaches merit, excuse me, I've turned too many pages here, attaches merit to voluntary poverty. In other words, you got, you're a better Christian if you're voluntarily poor and you derive spiritual benefit from the Roman Catholic Church if you're poor. Let me read that again. Make sure this really sinks in. It says, And to indicate this preference, he applauds the moral elevation and personal dignity of the Catholic peasantry, which he considers due to the fact that their religion, that is Roman Catholicism, attaches merit spiritual merit to voluntary poverty and, quote, regards the poor as blessed and a blessing, unquote. 
And it says, with this estimate of the sweets and blessings of poverty, he denounced the poor houses which Protestantism has caused to be erected wherever it prevails as modern bastilles, he calls them, insisting that the poor had better be left in their happy condition of poverty than to be shut up as criminals, unquote. In other words, these bastilles, these poor houses, set up so-called by Protestants, is servitude and slavery, peasantry, and they would be best left to their condition of poverty than to be shut up in prisons. Listen, there's n not a more captivating prison than being a subject of the Pope where every thought and will of the heart is derived from the papacy, where no man can think for himself, no man can read for himself, especially not the Bible. And no man may do anything except that which the papacy approves. You talk about spiritual, intellectual, and physical bondage. There is no greater bondage in the world than being a subject of the tyrant of Rome. History reveals that to be true. A history that is largely forgotten in this country. A history which R.W. Thompson is intimately aware and is warning the American people in 1876 to avoid a recurrence of that slavery that captivated the minds, the hearts, the spirits, the tongues, the pens, and the persons of every individual in Roman Catholic Europe and made tortured, mangled meat out of anyone who asserted their liberty in Christ. Let not those days return, and especially not here in the United States of America. That's the warning from R.W. Thompson. He says, you'll look in vain among your non-Catholic... Uh, let me uh, make sure I haven't left something out here. He sums up his conclusion this way. He says, You will look in vain among your non-Catholic contemporaries for that clearness and vigor of intellect and that moral elevation, force, and independence of individual character which you meet everywhere in medieval society. If there are... If there were great crimes in those ages, they were followed, as the historian of the Monk of the West justly remarks, by great expiations. If there was great pride, there was deeper humility, and always will the period from the 6th to the end of the 15th century stand out as the most glorious in the annals of the human race. Unquote. He is lauding the heyday of the papacy, the, 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 the days that the, the world considers the dark ages. From the, from the 6th to the 15th century, he considers that the greatest progress of mankind, the period of the greatest progress of mankind, when the popes ruled supreme over the kings and over the people, where deplorable conditions existed. The people were illiterate. They were slaves to the land which the Roman Catholic Church owned. They didn't have any private property. They didn't have any rights. They were not allowed to read. And those who read, if they picked up the Bible, they had to have the bishop's permission and if they got to reading too well and understood the Bible and its condemnation of the Church of Rome, then they were excommunicated. They were deemed heretics. Their property was confiscated, and they were tortured mercilessly unto death. The papacy calls that the greatest period of human advancement. 
Now, how wonderfully perverted must be the best faculties of an American mind when it is brought to see in the condition of the world during the Middle Ages from the 6th to the 16th century that which is preferable to the present state of affairs among the Protestant nations, especially in the United States. Such an effect could only be produced by the unexampled influence which the papacy has been able to exercise over some of the brightest intellects of the world, a strange and misinfluence, which has brought them in, in, in subjection to, it, to its ambition, that is, the Roman Catholic Church's ambition, to the papacy's ambition, and appropriated all their best energies to itself. But we are concerned not only with the existence of, of such a fact, rather than with an inquiry into the causes of it. Dr. Brownson is a distinguished instance, instance of this perverted intellect. His service to the papacy and his quick defense of all its extravagant claims have acquired for him a reputation among the Roman Catholic hierarchy which may flatter but cannot console him. When he recurs to the principle and influences under which his mind was developed into its brilliant maturity and by means of which it acquired its freedom, the remembrance must be to him like the yearning after a lost treasure. But whether he derives regret or rejoicing from his present position, he must be regarded as expressing not merely his own, but the sentiments and opinions of the Roman Catholic hierarchy of the United States when he gives the preference to the condition of Europe during the Middle Ages, when ignorance, superstition, and degradation were almost universal among the population over that in which the people of this country now are. Blind and passive submission to the priesthood then prevailed throughout all the ranks of society. Therefore, the people were abundantly happy. They were so ignorant as not to know that they were in bondage. Therefore, they were models of contentment. The masses were in the lowest poverty, while the nobility reveled in wealth and luxury. Therefore, they were in the state of blissful humility. They left the popes and their myriads of priestly dependents to do as they pleased and to bid defiance to all human laws Therefore, they had reached the point of the highest moral elevation? Who can account for such strange hallucinations of thought as this? How is it possible for a man to persuade himself or be persuaded by others to believe that this country would be improved and the people carried to a higher moral and political elevation if the existing condition of our affairs were destroyed and that which existed in the Middle Ages substituted. Certainly, no such thought can dwell long in the minds of any but those who, who, whose blind devotion shuts out the light of their reason. And yet, to bring about precisely that result, all the energies of the Roman Catholic Church, insofar as the papacy can direct them, are now assiduously and untiringly directed. Possibly those who are aiding in this work in the United States are merely laboring under honest delusion in the conviction that it may be done by peaceful means or that the people can be persuaded to give up to foreign dictation those national blessings which have always constituted their highest pride. But this they must and do know that what they labor for with so much diligence can only be accomplished by overthrowing our Protestant institutions, destroying our Protestant Christianity, and upheaving from its foundation our Protestant form of government. The new world order cannot be established until Protestantism is rooted out of this world and out of this country lock, stock, and barrel. And that's going to include violence, bloodshed, and lots of it to rival even that of the Dark Ages. 
We've wrapped up the week. We'll see you next week on Inquisition Update. R.W. Thompson, The Papacy and the Civil Power. Get a copy. I'll see you next week.